Welcome to the show. Today I'm lucky enough to be joined by Discovery's visual effects supervisor. He's on the phone. It's Jason Zimmerman. Uh, welcome to Trek Zone, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Now, I was reading online that there were 1,665 effects shots uh, in the 15-episode second season. Obviously, that doesn't all drop on you at once, but how do you and the team tackle something so massive as a, as a sci-fi, as a Star Trek show? Uh, it's sort of like how you eat an elephant, right? It's one bite at a time. <laughs> so you really, you, you break it down by episodes, you break it down by script. I mean, you break it even down by scene to sort of get an idea of, you know, what each sequence requires. Um, and, you know, you have both the, the shorter view of what, what episode is in front of you, like episode one, but then, you know, you have the overview of what's coming down the pipe and what, you know, assets and uh, different things you need to start building and creating in order to service, you know, the episodes coming in the future. So it's really sort of, you know, just taking a multi-pronged approach. I mean, fortunately for me, I have a very, very good small team that, uh, you know, we've been together for a while. And so we know just how to sort of break things down and make it, you know, palatable one, one, one shot at a time. And it's not just those space scenes, is it? They, there's also the planet exteriors, some uh, additional parts to the scene, to, to the physical sets as well. Uh, I think there was some, you know, some behind the scenes footage of, of Discovery and a lot of the, the shuttle bay and, and those sort of areas are filled out in visual effects as well, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, there's, I mean, there, we, we do have some sets that, uh, you know, are minimal to, to no visual effects, but in some instances, you know, Shuttle Bay is a good example. Uh, we basically have one main wall and a ramp and a floor, and the rest of it is, uh, you know, about 270 degrees of green screen. So, um, yeah, there are, there's there's different, you know, levels to the amount of set extension, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's windows, there's those sorts of things. So there's always at least something small for us to touch, yeah. <laughs> now, I don't think I'm exaggerating here when I say Such Sweet Sorrow, the two-part season final, brought us the biggest battle sequence since Deep Space Nine's finale. With such complexities, including pure CG shots and the green screen footage, um, especially with Burnham out there in, in, the, in the environmental suit, mm -hmm. how do you approach making all all of those shots uh, marry in together and, and look like one continuous uh, scene? Uh, well, I mean, I think it really boils down to good planning. I mean, fortunately for us, you know, Alex Kurtzman and the, the writing team and Michelle, the showrunner, and the, Tinde, the producing director, um, you know, this is something that we had been talking about for quite some time. Alex had prepared us that this was going to be coming. And so, you know, we started, you know, a few months before sort of planning, okay, what are we, what exactly are we talking about? You know, looking at the calendar to make sure we had enough time and then, you know, just sort of starting to flesh things out. And then when we got the scripts and finally got into putting everything together, we started first versions of pre and storyboards almost right away working concurrently with production so that we would have something to cut in. I mean, the, 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 the challenge when you have so many CG shots is that we, you know, we need to generate, you know, versions for the editors to use, even for the editor's cut, you know, prior, right about the same time we're shooting the footage because there's so many shots that inform what the cut is going to be. So, um, you know, we generated first versions of shots and, and, and in previs and, you know, in some cases we were pretty close and in some cases they needed to be adjusted once we saw the practical footage. Um, but at least we had something. And so, you know, that was part of it. And then the, it, it, when we when we finally got, you know, when we finally shot the footage and got it cut together, um, you know, we sat down with Alex, we sat down with Tunde, and we sort of went through everything painstakingly and said, okay, what, you know, what needs to be adjusted to sort of reflect, uh, you know, what was shot. One, one thing that we did do is we built sort of a, a battlefield diagram very early on that, you know, sort of defined how the Discovery and Enterprise would be surrounded, uh, you know, where the Section 31 ships would show up, how they would surround them, you know, where the drones would sort of occupy, where the battlefield was. Um, so we kind of had an idea, this you know, basic layout of, okay, here's where things are. And then we, we tried to script, um, you know, based on that, we tried to sort of identify, you know, the first few scenes where the battle starts. It'll happen sort of in this area here. And then, you know, sort of progressively map out where things would start to happen um, throughout the course of the battle. And that diagram kind of held pretty well for us. Uh, and then, you know, once once we got into the previs, we could just refer back and say, okay, I think this is happening over here. This is happening in this part of it. Um, and it sort of served as a, a roadmap for us throughout the process. Uh, you know, fortunately for us, you know, Tunde was very um, instrumental in, 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 in sort of helping us, you know, by directing the previs shots and making sure that we, you know, geographically were honoring what we were shooting on the view screens and everything else. So it, it really was about planning as much as humanly possible prior to shooting and then, you know, doing these constant check-ins with 
uh, producers, with director, just to make sure we're on the right path and everything. And I think, you know, because of that, we were able to, to sort of execute something that, that was pretty cohesive. How long does it take to, in for such sweet sorrow specifically, how long does it, how long did it take to go from previs to a final deliverable? Oh, I mean, we were, we had, I think about, we had a couple, couple months, I want to say something like that. But I mean, we were, we, we, there were, there were shots that we were receiving almost up until the last days of, you know, our deliveries um, where we had had previs versions. But, you know, there, when you, when you get into some of these shots that are, you know, so close up with the high res textures and the simulations for the explosions and the, you know, just the sheer volume of, of ships between the fighters and the drones and everything else. Uh, you know, there, there, there were renders that took, I, I want to say weeks probably that we had to, you know, just patiently wait on. And, 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 you know, fortunately our team at Pixamondo, which is one of our lead vendors uh, is just phenomenal at CG and, and, and generating these things. And so we, we, we had, we had a lot of faith that it was going to, to, to look good and in some instances even the, the first versions of shots were very very far along and, and, and very close to what you see uh, in the final product how does streaming differ to traditional tv in terms of those delivery deadlines and even sort of creative choices as well with with what we see uh in in the final edits sure i mean you, you definitely have more time with streaming uh, you know, I, I, as I, I, I come up as a, as a visual effects artist. I started as a compositor, uh, you know, many years ago. And I can remember, you know, working on a weekly show that aired, you know, once a week. And so you had to deliver a few days before in order to make sure that you got on air. But the, the, the good thing is that we start enough in advance that we do have a little bit more time to, to sort of, you know, be very targeted and plan sequences out and, and you know, really spend the time to, you know, add the bells and whistles to the visual effects that you may not have the time for. And, you know, it's something that you have to turn around once a week. And so I think you definitely benefit from the time. You definitely, uh, you know, benefit from the opportunity to, to, to push the scope and scale of something um, to, 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 to something much larger, like the space battles that we did, um, than you would maybe if you had less time. So I think time is definitely a contributing factor in a lot of ways. I think it's the best currency you have in visual effects in order to make things look good. Well, with five shows in the Star Trek pipeline, uh, what's the feeling like at uh, at CBS at Television City for for Trekkies and and for all the stuff that's to come? I mean, I think you know, speaking speaking as you know the, the supervisor for Discovery and and you know, hopefully being involved in the other things, it's 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 exciting. I mean, it's it's an it's an expanding world that has a lot of room for expansion, and there's you know a lot of. Um, cool stuff coming down the pipeline that is, you know, y- unique and, and, and each has its own, you know, probably going to have its own aesthetic and everything. So it's it's exciting to be a part of such a massive universe. I mean, just being a visual effects supervisor, you know, coming up, like I said, I mean, I, I started this because I, I loved the idea of playing with, you know, dinosaurs and robots and spaceships and all those things. So to be able to be on a show like this, to, to, I think it really hit me on episode 15 of season one where we finally did that shot of the, the Enterprise, and I, and I just looked at it, and I kind of looked at everybody in the room, and I said, I can't believe we're working on the Enterprise. It was just such a surreal moment. I mean, I knew you know, for a long time that we had been building the asset, but to see it show up and to hear that music you know, play over the top of it was, was so cool, and to be a part of that has is, is just been fantastic. I mean, it's also it's, it's daunting because, you know, as you alluded to, the, the fan base, the Trekkies are just, um, they're so, so... Um, informed when it comes to visual effects. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, you know, Star Trek especially helped to drive uh, visual effects for television um, for a very long time. And, I, you know, I, 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 I have happened to come after a, a whole bunch of visual effects teams and supervisors that just did such an incredible job at actually, you know, building the runway for us, uh, you know, de- developing looks, developing methodologies and all that. And so, you know, to, to, to be a part of that has been fantastic and, and to be beholden to the fans who, probably know as much about visual effects as any fan ever possibly could they'll tell you if it doesn't look good they know what it's supposed to be doing they know how it's supposed to move um you know you really you 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 got you got to you got to do your best because they are expecting it and 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 they are going to look at it and scrutinize it and 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 it's it's their world and so we're just trying to do our best to do it justice well, just very quickly on that, on the Enterprise and, and such an iconic moment there at the end of season one, um, how, what was the sort of design process uh, on rebuilding the Enterprise? Uh, was there ever a thought of um, bringing the, the classic ship back or was it always sort of going to be an updated uh, look? Well, 
I mean, I think, you know, we're, we are definitely our own show. I mean, I do have to give a lot of credit. The, 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 the design came well before us. I mean, you know, the art department, production design, I believe John Eves worked on it, you know, extensively. So, you know, we, we, we knew we were doing a version of a, of a ship that has to be incredibly um, recognizable just by its silhouette, obviously. You know, fortunately for us, we were sort of handed a, a design and a, and, a, and a model that looked incredible already. So for me, it was just about, you know, taking what we had gotten and bringing it to life with textures and with scale and everything to really, really make it look as good as it could be for our show. Fantastic, Jason. Well, thanks so much for having a Trek Zone conversation today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much.